General Alexander, let me start with a really key question. Does the US have the capability to prevent Russia from launching a nuclear attack through any kind of cyber means? Great question. I can't answer that, obviously, <laughs> but it's a great question. I would say that um, that has so many facets to how you could stop an attack and what you do that it would be reasonable to assume that the government looks at all options, not just cyber, to do that and across its portfolio, um, to look at every aspect of a launch and the precision that goes with it and stuff. So I would, I would expect. I have no inside knowledge. I've been out for eight years plus. But that's, that's what you would want our government to do, you would want our allies to do, is how do you stop something like that? How do you shoot it down uh, if one were to occur? Um, that question has a second part. What about in Ukraine, a tactical nuclear weapon? That would be more difficult, right, because that's something that's going to go very quickly. Uh, so the key would be trying to understand, did they deploy nuclear weapons to the theater? That's got to be an intel, not a cyber, an intel function. And try to get out in front of that. So it's both parts. So yours is on the strategic. I'd expect all nations would work on that. On the tactical, much more difficult. What's the lead time for knowing if anything is being deployed in, in terms of an intelligence operation? Well, it depends again. So, you know, the... You know, it's not something you just pull out of the garage whip up and fire it off. So I suspect that they would deploy and have the trained units and stuff there if they were going to do it. And those indications would probably be picked up by foreign intel, ours, Europe, and others. I think they would, they would actually do that. And I suspect that our government and other governments would be messaging Putin on just that, uh, as the president has already done. I think those are the right things to talk about what that impact would be on this war and what our nation, Europe, and NATO would be willing to do in the next step after that. So really tough, you know, Putin's in a tough place. You know, by asking that question, you know, his back is up against the wall. He thought he would take over Ukraine. He thought this would be 72 hours. They're going to fall on their back. And the Ukrainian president and their military and the Ukrainian people changed all that. They are the real freedom fighters of our generation. They're fighting for their lives. And it's obviously a very tense situation now. You've previously said that the use of tactical nuclear weapons in this conflict you thought was unlikely. Is that still your assessment? I, I still believe it's unlikely. I believe he's considering it. He's for sure considering it, and there are options that he could look at, testing and other things. I think if he uses a tactical nuclear weapon, that's the end of his regime. I think countries would now start to move in in a much more aggressive way, and, and it would be right to do so. So I, I think what he's trying to figure out is how does he get out of this uh, corner that he's in? And everything he tries to do, he's being pushed back on. You know, I just want the four regions of eastern Ukraine. Oh. The Ukrainians are fighting back and having great success against it. So he's losing. And that means in Russia, the media, your counterparts, the intelligence community, and the military are starting to lose faith in him. And by losing faith, those are the three elements of power that he needs to stay in power. So the massive uh, set of launches, missile launches over uh, the last few days against Ukraine we were meant to show that he's still in power and he's still firm, but they didn't uh, get what he really needs. I think it's on a downward trend for him. And so what does he do? That's where the nuclear weapon question comes in. Do you really think he's under pressure in his leadership? And, and how do those cracks yeah, develop I, and show and expand? Uh, up until now, they really haven't. Well, actually, there has been a lot. So if you look at the military bloggers in, in Russia, and there's a whole bunch of them, they criticized that Russia was doing a half step in the war. They weren't applying the full force. Where's the full mobilization? Get the Russian army out. Make this fight. Uh, 
And he, remember, he looked at Gorbachev and what he did in uh, Afghanistan as a huge failure. It caused the, the collapse of the Soviet Union because they fought in Afghanistan, but they pulled people out of Moscow and out of St. Petersburg. Think of all the major cities. And the Russian people turned against him, turned against Gorbachev. So he didn't want to do that in Ukraine. So he's, when he's recruiting people, this, this army that he's building, it's from the minority groups. But it's not the training, the time, and all that's insufficient. So the military bloggers, I think one of the things, you know, especially with your background and insights, I would track what are the military bloggers saying about the war. These are key people that in the past have been pro-Putin that question it. Same with the intelligence community and the same with the media. And you are seeing cracks in all of those. So I think that, that for him is of great concern. What he'll do is he'll push back, arrest key individuals and those things to get a check and try to stop that. I think it's too little too late on both the conscription. Those people won't be ready to fight for a long time. And I think the military bloggers, the military, the intelligence community, and the media will see this as we're losing this war. Why are we here? And we've alienated the rest of the people, and it's killing our economy. And if they don't fully mobilize, they'll never be able to beat Ukraine. Do you see a pressure point developing to such a point that he uh... – <laughs> How, how, how does uh, his future look in the scenario that you're painting? Bad. His, his, I think the future in all of those looks bad for him. Now, you know, this is where, I, uh, you know, the, a military dictator like him, what he's going to do is he's going to try to suppress the people and stay in power. At some point, I think people are going to start to move against him. I really do. I think that's going to get to the point where the Russian people and some of these different, the military intel community, are going to move against him. He's going to try to stop that, and that's the, the fractures within Russia that we'll see. What can he do in Ukraine as a half step to get there? I, I don't see the Russian military able to have an effective counterattack. They, they can do local, but their forces, the morale is low. They're losing faith. Many of them didn't want, you know, initially they thought this was a peacekeeping thing. And now they're seeing all the people that are being killed and wounded. So it's a, it's, he's in a difficult place. He really is. On the spectrum of uh, apply more pressure, provide exit ramps, can you talk about how that balance needs to work? You've previously argued for more pressure. You've argued for a no-fly zone, which is not, of course, what the, what the US government is doing, um, to, to take back the initiative. There's actually been criticism, of course, of the administration for uh, and, and others for not doing more to provide exit ramps. How do you see that spectrum? For him to exit, I think if he exits where he is today, it's a failure, and that would lead to his downfall. He's got to exit with some kind of win or some way of showing a win or blame somebody and make that stick as if it wasn't him like Shogu, the Minister of Defense. So I'd say the Minister of Defense, he's, he's uh, on the first chair and next to him is Putin. I don't think Shogu will be good enough for the Russian people if they withdraw. Um, with respect to the uh, no-fly zone, you know, I do think putting pressure, how do you defend the Ukrainian people? What is it, our responsibility, without getting into a war with Russia? Um, that could be a greater war, that could be a real disaster. And so <clears throat> we have to look at all the different things. I can start with the no-fly zone. And I think the half step is, well, how about we put in an air defense system and network to shoot down missiles and aircraft and provide the Ukrainians that? Um, it doesn't mean U.S. forces and others are applying the, the no-fly zone because Ukraine doesn't have the, the Air Force to do it. That's probably a better half-step right now. I think that's, that's probably the right choice, and you can see all the countries kind of agree because they're moving the air defense platforms in. I think that's, that's exactly right. What does that say to Putin? You did A, now we're going to do all this. And 
The other part that came up in those missiles that's really telling is those missiles, the precision guided missiles that they have require technology, which they don't have access to because of all of the sanctions. And so now they're shooting dumb missiles and those don't have the accuracy to, to get what they need. And he's got to save his precision for, for other events on the tactical side, of force on force. In reining in your vision for a no-fly zone, what does that mean? Does that mean that really you think a no-fly zone would create a direct conflict between the US and Russia? Or have you always advocated it as, as a means of stepping up but never actually getting as far as you I, I think suggested? it's absolutely something that should be considered. And the question is, how do you do it? If you're going to do a no-fly zone and not have our forces involved, that means you've got to give them the aircraft, you've got to give them the training, and you've got to help them on that. That uh, potentially was a red line that our government was not willing. And so they have access to classified information, which we don't have. I suspect that they're doing the steps very deliberately to not get into a war with Russia. And, you know, my personal belief is Russia does not have the military to fight NATO, period. You can see that. They can't fight Ukraine, let alone uh, NATO. And NATO has no desire to go into Russia. So I think he makes that up to, to get the Russian people behind him. But eventually, the people are going to understand that's not true. So Let's come to your particular um, expertise in cyber. In, in February, before the invasion, you said that if there were an invasion, it could lead to the first full-scale cyber war. Now, as you know, there have been many analysts who've said that hasn't happened. What's your assessment of, of what we've seen? So there's two parts to that. First, um, in Ukraine, there has been a huge increase in cyber activities, destructive cyber attacks. As I told you, I had an opportunity to speak to their minister of digitization this morning. And his comment was the attacks have been significant. And they see future ones coming that could be more destructive. And they're worried about that. And they're working on it. And it's not just going to hit them. It could hit Europe and the United States. So he was really concerned about that. At the same time, we defend forward as a nation. I think that's something that's out in the press that uh, General Nakasone talks about. How do you defend forward um, and stop somebody from attacking you? I think that's been very successful, not only in helping on the elections, but in this place too. And I suspect it's not just our country, but our allies are doing the same thing. So that's difficult for them to do all of this. Their primary objective was Ukraine, and I think they focused on that. But you hit on a key point here, because cyber, you know, he wants to win in Ukraine. He's not going to win in Ukraine. He's not doing it. What can he do to get the American people and the European people to back off of support for Ukraine and make the pain here so much that we say it's not worth it to us? And that could be through attacks on critical infrastructure and other things that, you know, think of you know, the colonial pipeline times 10 here and in Europe. What is the colonial pipeline times 10 in America? Oh, so, well, the colonial pipeline, if you recall, just in one week of that being down, there were gas lines that people were getting concerned. You, you could see the, the, what do we do? We're running out of gas. Um, that could be a huge impact if you did the colonial pipeline, multiplied it in 10 areas, and or do other critical infrastructure that impacts us or the European Union. So those are, I think, clearly under consideration by Russia. This is something they would look at. I, I suppose the point is, from the US perspective, is those attacks on critical infrastructure in the US haven't happened yet. Why not? And why do you think he would make that decision to start? Yeah, so the reason, my opinion, is right now up to this point, it's been focused on the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian government to win in Ukraine. His forces are hammering the Ukrainian government, military, and critical infrastructure. And a lot of companies are helping to build them back. And I think that, you know, the Europe and the United States helping in that has been very useful for Ukraine. But they are getting attacked. Make no mistake there. So that's been his focus to win in Ukraine. He's not going to win in Ukraine, and he's starting to see that. And the reason he's not going to win in Ukraine is because the United States and Europe are behind him providing weapons. So the question is, how do you get them to stop? 
how do you get us to stop support? And I think he's going to say, well, we're going to give them some of the pain to do that, and it would be in cyber. If it's any other military action, it, it, it defeats what he's trying to do. He wants us to withdraw support so he can have those four regions and claim victory. And so that's, the, that's going to be the diplomatic, military, strategic fight right now. But the Biden administration has been so clear that it will respond heavily to any Russian attack on US critical infrastructure. Uh, why would he take that risk? Well, when you're cornered and you have no other alternatives, a nuclear weapon would be, I think, a step too far. So what can you do that we really don't have the strategic infrastructure thought process on? This is a cyber attack. What do you do? And if Putin says, well, it wasn't me, it was these hackers. So what he's going to do is look to the hackers and use them as the, I think, the folks that go after it. Does plausible deniability work anymore in this context? Well, it doesn't have to work. 100%. He can say it wasn't us. We can say we know it's you. He can say it wasn't us. And you can see how that's going to go. And so then the question is, uh, now you get the, the more clandestine war going. And I think that's where it would pick up. Um, and I, I just, you know, when, as I look at all the options he's got on the table, and you, you do a strategic analysis of all of that, you'd say, if I use the nuclear weapon, I'm out. What can I do to make those guys stop providing weapons and helping Ukraine stay in? Uh, so it's got to be something in that area. But given the US has said they'll hold Russia accountable for even proxies, um, does that mean that the US still doesn't have strong enough responses on this front? I think it's, I think it's a different question. When you look at that, it's not just in Russia that these guys could come from, but it's a global attack. And seeing those attack on critical infrastructure is very difficult. And so that's the hard part. When you think about, you know, despite what everybody says, the US government is not looking at everybody's network and, and watching them. And so the fact that they hit a critical infrastructure, whether it's uh, energy, oil and gas, you know, defense industrial base, transportation, you hit one of those, the chances that the government will see it ahead of time is very slim. And so you lose that. Now you can go after them, but you've, you've already lost. It's like uh, there's a missile hitting a city. We don't know until the city's been hit, and they call us up, and we just got hit with a missile. For all the investors in, in the audience watching, um, of course, the US has warned before about Russian malware being on critical infrastructure. That, of course, includes uh, financial services. To what extent do you think Russia has malware on the systems now, new malware that the US has yet to discover today? Um, well, I would say almost for sure on some. I think my uh, assessment of the, of the big companies do really good in protecting their infrastructure. So I think it's going to be in some. I think they're going to have success in some. And there are parts of our infrastructure that are very difficult to hit or to defend. So you're seeing states hit right? State infrastructure, you're seeing airports be hit, all these things that, that provide that. That's going on now. And the question that I think we should ask is that the prelude, is that test for future? Um, and the answer, you know, I would say we have to consider it, that it is a test. They are practicing for something and we need to be ready for it. You've talked before about a 9-11 in terms of uh, cyber threat. Do you still hold on to that idea, the sort of the cyber Pearl Harbor idea has sort of gone out a little of fashion? Are, are you still holding on to it? I, I do think that, you know, knowing what the offense can do concerns me that our defense is not ready. And it's not just our offense, it's others as well. Now those, now you push cyber into uh, an act of war when you do that. And the issue is proving it and convincing the United Nations that you have the proof to do that. You know, so that's, that's going to be the issue that's played out on this. Um, you, you mentioned cyber defense is not 
being adequate. Obviously, the Biden administration has taken many people from your old agency and put them at the top of different elements. Um, government Accountability Office saying there still isn't enough uh, coordination. Even uh, there's another report from them out saying uh, nuclear contractors are, are inconsistent in the way they look at their own um, cyber practices. Why is it still so far coming from behind? Well, <clears throat> great question, because this shows what you're hitting on is the real issue that we have to look at in cyber. Today, every company defends itself. Every agency defends itself. Think of that as every city had to defend itself. We'd lose. And yet, that's what we're doing in cyber today. We share what we know once we know it, but there is no way to create a cyber radar for collective defense. That's what we have to do. That's hard because you have to train people, you have to deploy capabilities to do that. But I think that's the future of cyber. It's just a question of what forces us to make that move. It's like building that radar system that you'll put into Ukraine to defend from the missile and air attacks to now say, how do you do something like that across the country, our country and our allies to defend against cyber? That's where we've got to get to. And I think the hard part is the SOC analysts, those, those analysts that are actually down in the trenches working it, right now they're defending by themselves, doing the best they can. But if everybody defends by themselves, you know, there's a, we have a historical thing. If we uh, fight alone, we're going to die alone. That's why we have to fight together. The 13 states, that's one of the models. You've, um... I wasn't there, no. <laughs> You've, you've talked about um, joint security operations, suggesting the private sector companies can come together and actually take action, not just defend, but take action. Is that really on the cards? I, I, I don't know how much. So, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm not an advocate for commercial companies taking offensive action. I think what commercial companies can do, just as we do for cities and our radar, they'd say it's coming from there. And the federal government has a responsibility to defend. And that's what we've got to practice. We've got to practice that just as you would any other element of warfare. And it's by training all those analysts in all these different companies how to work together, how to share information, how to do that. I think that's part of the future. Because this, this area is going to break wide open. And you know, unfortunately, we don't know where and how, but I am concerned about that. Um, we were given special dispensation to have a little five minutes extra, so I'm going to definitely take that since we have you. Um, in, in the case of Iran, um, how vulnerable is Iran to a potential Stuxnet-style attack, if ever uh, it were on the cards again? I think Iran, um, there's a couple things with Iran. First, as you look at it, Iran is breaking apart right now with all the riots and stuff that are going on. Uh, the supreme leader, I think, is, is not healthy. I think the potential uh, leader coming in, Ibrahim Raisi, is even more conservative. He was on the commission, the committee that um, judged all those people in 1988 and sentenced them to death, tens of thousands. This is a really bad place. With respect to the question, so how do you stop Iran from making a race to a nuclear weapon? That's the question. And what do you do to prevent that from happening? That's what the administration has got to weigh. Is there some capability out there that they can use? I don't know the answer to that. Again, I've been out for eight and a half years. But I would suspect you'd look at all elements. Here's the concern I have, is that if Iran does make a race to a nuclear weapon, we have to be concerned that Israel is going to react in its nation's interest and try to stop it. And that's the problem you create in the Middle East. And so this is the issue that you have. Well, how do you keep Iran from making a race to a weapon which they said they would use on Israel and keep the Israelis knowledgeable that they're not making that race? That's the issue. I, I see you're saying there are various things that anyone could in, in the US might think about. But do you think cyber, like, after you know, the, the the Stuxnet, Stuxnet attack um, is, a, is a potential 
plausible avenue now as the JCPOA effort to get it back on track is, is uh, looks like it's not I think out. I think cyber is one of the elements that they would look at across the board. You would look at all of those. Um, and it's logical that you would do that. Um, I do, I, we're obviously in an investor crowd. Um, you've You've got your own company now, which you started in 2014. You took it public via SPAC uh, last year. And you're in a difficult position today. Uh, your share price has gone from $41, I think, last year. It's at 52 cents today. I think that's an all-time low. Um, you took a pay cut th this week. You have volunteered to go down to, I think, $50,000 a year from 360 baseline that you were at before lost a lot of staff, you were a co-CEO, you were a CEO on your own now. Uh, it, tell us what that experience is like for you. Well, I think clearly it's tough when you have to reduce force with people that you've worked with. But as a public company, it's our responsibility to make this company viable on sound uh, financial foundation and continuing to push the product and, and to have a company that will be really good in the future. So we have to look for the future. It's interesting, we're not the only ones cutting and we're not the only ones losing value. But you hit the key point, that's of concern. We have to build that back. We have to go back to the street on the financial and all the issues that we promised them and we will do that. And we have to show that what we're talking about here is collector defense. That's what our company does. Nobody else builds the tools SOC analysts need to defend together. We need to do that. Is there a problem with the product or faith in the product? I think the problem that we have is we've got to train SOC analysts to use it. It's a more advanced system than you would normally get. So if you have an advanced SOC operator or you train them to that, they find it very useful. So you have people that really like it. And then if you bring in... Uh, a junior analyst and it's difficult for them to use it, they want to just be told what to do. We've got to train SOC analysts to take that next step and work with them, and we're doing that. The other part, I think the more accurate part for us is that we try to start here with companies. And so what we realized is that, well, we have this technology we should share on threats that we see, on command and control for infrastructure. And so we created a new product and, and sent that out and announced that on September 29th called Iron Radar. And the intent was, what if we could see future command and control by countries like Russia and others before they use it and provide that to people? How valuable would that be? And everybody said, wow, that would be great. So, that, so we're going to take that half step to help us get more market share and then move up. We're going to still push this collective defense. That's the key to the future. And we are getting traction. We just got to get that going. The last thing, of course, is you're facing a class action complaint. Um, in, in that, that, that's from a, some investors who say that at the beginning, when you, when you went public, um, that they're calling it fraud. They're saying that um, you sold uh, shares once the share price was high, uh, 5.1 million dollars worth in a short amount of time. That was 85% of the available shares that you're allowed to sell in that time. Um, I don't think you've submitted the legal response to that yet. I'm sure it's coming, but can you um, let us know how you respond to that claim? Yeah. So, so we did, we actually did respond to that in our 10Q, and we thought that the lawsuit was without merit and that we defend it vigorously. And so we put that on the table. And the, and the, you know, the article you hit on claimed that I sold 85%. You know that's not true because you said it exactly right. Um, I still own 96% of my shares. I'm in this company because I think it's the right thing to do for our country. And I believe we need something like this. And so we're going to figure out a way to make it work. And that's, you know, that's what we got to do. And, you know... Um, no one likes to be where we are. Well, you look at the whole tech industry. Nobody wants to be where the tech industry is today. But the reality is we can see where this product will go and what we'll do in the future. And we've got a great team of people that really understand the value. So I think a lot of work to do. 
uh, make no, you know, I, I won't, you know, try to push that aside. There's a lot of work that we need to do to get there. I think we can do it.